As of early December, IHS Jane's Terrorism and Insurgency Centre has recorded more than 19,000 attacks across the course of 2014. While this represents a slight decrease from the number of attacks recorded in 2013, the number of fatalities from these attacks has increased by more than 20%, from almost 35,000 deaths in 2013 to more than 41,000 deaths in 2014 so far. So without doubt, the most significant non-state armed group across the course of 2014 has been the Islamic State, which has been extremely active in both Iraq and Syria. JTIC recorded the Islamic State as being responsible for more than 10% of all terrorist or insurgent violence worldwide across the course of 2014, although it was likely responsible for a far greater proportion than we were able to definitively attribute to the group. The Islamic State has continued with its strategy of creating ungovernable spaces in which A, it can operate, and B, it hopes to come in and establish government at a future date as it had done in Iraq and Syria. However, since the coalition airstrikes began, um, there was less emphasis on governing, more emphasis on making sure that rival groups can't govern. And in addition, the Islamic State started spinning the narrative that this is proof that there's an ongoing war against the Sunni community. Much more significantly, however, the leader of the Islamic State, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, called in November in 2014 on supporters of the Islamic State to actually set up cells at home and join local units rather than travel and join the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, as has customarily been the case. Baghdadi's message to call on fighters to set up locally has been coupled with the return of a number of Libyan fighters to set up camp in Derna. We're concerned that if fighters start returning, in particular to uh, Libya, Tunisia and Egypt, these governments would be overwhelmed by uh, well-trained uh, militants coming into the country. These militants would probably aspire to create ungovernable spaces in which they can thrive, and so they would probably target energy, tourism, security forces and basic government services. In recent months, uh, one of the Al-Qaeda affiliates has actually put out warnings that they want to attack uh, pipelines and tankers which are running on the trade from the Middle East. Now obviously the Strait of Hormuz is very narrow and that could be a point where shipping could be attacked. However, lots of the ships which come through the Strait of Hormuz, which about there's 300 tankers a month come out, which is around 85 million deadweight tonnes. Only a fraction of those end up going through the Gulf of Aden up into the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal, which around 50 tankers a month pass through. Now the Suez Canal could actually be a place where attacks are more likely to happen on shipping. Well the impact from the energy point of view in the region is that Syria and Iraq are both being affected by, the, uh, by these uh, groups. Syria in particular has gone from production of around 350,000 barrels a day down to 30,000 barrels. In Iraq, not so much, though damage to pipelines and, and other facilities has caused some disruption. This sort of scared off foreign investors such as ExxonMobil and Chevron. They pulled their teams out for a while, however, they've now returned. Not so much can be said for Syria, where foreign investors have just disappeared from the scene. Other vulnerability in the area can be seen in Qatar and Kuwait, where similar facilities could be at risk. Quantifying the ramifications in the recent upsurge in global terrorism is critical to effectively countering asymmetric threats. And this is something that IHS has the ability to offer in great depth by providing historical perspective and forward-looking analysis from IHS Jane's with unparalleled data and insight from energy, maritime and trade. Some of the solutions that form part of this vital intelligence are the mapping of threats, the analysis of terrorist groups' capability and strategy, intentions and limitations, the analysis of armed force capabilities and deployments, procurement and budget trends, data visualization and discovery, geoint and imint, and knock-on effects on specific countries and industries.